Man. I need to take a dip. A dip? In in, in need, what? Like in, in caramel? In, in... No, in the ocean. Hmm. Like right the second or? <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, no, we got stuff to do now. <laughs> we got, we're, Such we're doing Ramomancy, stuff right Which now. we are like, now live with. <laughs> what? Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ramblemancy. <laughs> Okay, you got me there. <laughs> I and I'm and, uh, heard it. What? What? Got, okay. I, you got me there, and I'm watching. Yeah. Uh, the delay. The delay. It's real. Yeah. Anyway, hello, <laughs> hello, and welcome to Ramble Mancy, everybody. Um, as I said, as I said, Olivia, you get <sighs> one. You get one for free, and then, then I will. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um. Anyway, also Rose is correct. Freeman, you will freeze. You will die. Um, it's oh. the Pacific Northwest. You will die. Oh, I've been training for it. I take cold showers. I'm ready. <laughs> True. You know Already. What? I think that's. I, I mean, think that's how that works. Not really, but it kind of helps. Yeah. Well, <laughs> welcome everybody. Uh, it's good to see all of you. Um, we are here to talk about um, storytelling and TTRPGs and media. Um, but first, I just want to go quick run down, run down the list and say hello, Jolly Old Abnix List, Age of Fit, Geek Outs, Koala Aquabear, Rose, welcome, hello. Gemini Lightning, hello everybody, it is good to see you all here. Oh, I also saw John, John is here in the chat. Hello, um, John. Hello, John. Um, well, uh, tonight we are going to be talking about storytelling in, across theoretically across all media but likely we'll do what we always do which is talk about tabletop rpgs um however before we get to that we've got a few things um oh yes of course hessen hello i saw you as well and i accidentally refreshed the chat so i didn't remember that you were there <laughs> but i do remember seeing you hi good to see you um so uh we've got a few things to talk about first of all um our latest episode of infinite horizon is on youtube as of today at noon pacific time um we uh did some <laughs> did some space stuff it was we got a, to roll so much uh, it was so exciting it was, very cool. it, was a, it was a fun episode um so yeah so that's up today um the new episode of into deep goes up tomorrow um so you will be able to catch that on youtube uh tomorrow um and of course this coming week we will be back with into deep on tuesday at 4 p.m pacific time um it's uh it's gonna be very fun um they have an inn now and they named it the incorporeal which is my favorite thing because it's a haunted inn so it's my favorite thing anyway it's it's a very fun show with a bunch of fun people, and you should watch it. Um, we will be back on Wednesday with uh, Infinite Horizon, um, where we will continue where we left off before at 6 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday. And next Friday uh, – wait, is that true? Is it next Friday? Let me just check my calendar here because I know when things are. Uh, yeah, next Friday uh, for Ramblemancy – we're going to have a special guest. Uh, Omar Najam is going to be joining us uh, on Ramblemancy to talk about media favorites. It's going to be really fun. I'm very excited to talk with Omar. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, Omar is over on Q Times uh, on Caitlin's other superhero actual play, <laughs> Power Play. Um, so, yeah, so Omar will be here joining us. And I've been wanting to talk to that guy forever. And so yeah, we finally we finally got him uh, coming on Ramble Mancy. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of our lineup, and uh, that's what we got. That's what we got. That's really all I have. Pretty exciting. Pretty excited. Pretty yeah. excited. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Is, I think that's all we have, right? That's everything for for beginning announcements. I think so. I think so. I, uh, yeah <laughs> it's, we spent so long at the end of last year just like pushing through so many different projects that now it like 
I, I feel like we're all living in that post project PTSD where like every time we do announcements, it's like, okay, here's I'm our missing shows. One. Are we missing something? Uh, what are missing, we doing? Am I missing <laughs> something? Oh my gosh. Let me check my, let me check my, oh my God, let me check my list. Let me check my no, list. Just, just leisurely announcements. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. John says we flowers for Algernon ourselves for announcements. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. It's, uh, oh, man. yeah. That is such a specific comment. <laughs> I can't. That's so funny. But like, <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, well, well, before we get into tonight's topic, first of all, Olivia, welcome and thank you for stepping in oh. for John um, as he gets settled. Um, which, strictly speaking, he is mostly settled right now. However, um, moving is not a thing that happens in an afternoon, so it's probably good for John for you john to uh to be resting Mm -hmm. um but yeah nico 17 months whoa oh my gosh i just saw that too wow that's that's impressive yeah i am wow (laughs) thanks man it's good to see you is over a year (laughs) that's significantly over a year and i think it's almost a year and a half almost that's really yeah. cool wow mm-hmm. all right There's... i have not been able to make my voice crack on command ever i've reached a whole new like level of performance mm. Peak? No, not... no 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 Pre-peak? Okay. no i think i've come back into it i think i peaked no never mind <laughs> nico says it's been a bit how are y'all doing it has been it a bit really is. we missed um, you chat yeah we always we always miss you um but also understand that it's like fucking uh, 5 a.m. or something by the time we go live with Ramblemancy for you. So, uh, yeah. Is that true? Did I do my math right? Doesn't matter. It's late Morning? as fuck. Yeah, it's... <laughs> it's yeah, it's definitely a.m. <laughs> anyway. Um, <clears throat> 4 a.m. Okay. I was close. Um, yeah. So, anyway. Um, what are we? What are we talking about? tonight you guys with storytelling and stuff like that where do we where do we even begin hmm. oh where did it begin where did what begin are you talking about Story- it, the mo- the movie <laughs> the stephen king novel hey you can't caitlin's not here we can't talk right, about right. it we can't do that <laughs> we can't do that to caitlin <laughs> Storytelling. No, I meant storytelling. Where did it begin? I was kind of joking, but I don't know. It At could the really dawn story. Dawn of humankind. Humans would. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Um, I can't do that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. All right. Well. 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 Uh. I'll be honest with you. I'm. I'm a bit at a loss of where to even. Oh my god. We <laughs> can. We. Can... Yeah. We could start by maybe thinking about like what was kind of a a really probably one of the most early influential kind of stories or or kind of um, Ooh, like personal uh, yeah like like something that really made you want to story tell or yeah. be part of that story in some process. Uh, uh, Nico, to answer your question, tonight's topic is storytelling in TTRPGs and media. So um, just storytelling in general. Um, also, John says, you joke, Lucas, but I've had students hand me papers as a tutor that started with that. Oh, <laughs> I have been a student that uh, started a paper that way. Granted, I was also like, I was, no, I was going to say I was very young, but that's not entirely true. I definitely did that in college at least once. So, <sighs> um, an influential story. Hmm. Man. Hmm. I've got a few. Go for it. If you've got something, throw it oh, out. Oh man. I I think all right, so let's see what came first. The chicken or no, I'm kidding. So uh, it was like the Lord of the Rings. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is I think it's a big one for all of us. Or it's at least there yeah. <laughs> in the list. Uh I would have to say The Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper mm. was mm. that came sometime after. And I would have to say, uh, in between, actually, in between those two was Red Wall. You know, the little, the yeah, little, with little, the mice, little, the little mice, and all the yeah. creatures that go around. And 
and uh, Salamanstron, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, the the mountain where like the Badger King lives or Badger Lord. And like they, yeah, I think those like kind of a combination of those, and I'm probably missing some, probably got me into storytelling through the, through first Lord of the Rings, especially what actually started was I, I would listen to the Lord of the Rings and I would get really inspired with all of the um, creatures and all the mythology. And I was really into clay sculpture, nothing, nothing pretty by any means. I was like eight and I would make mm -hmm. like, I would make the ring wraiths. I would make orcs. I was just so, I was so <laughs> into all these, like mm -hmm. all everything. And then I moved from there. I kind of, and then I would like, I was still kind of like going outside. I lived, mm -hmm. you know, lived in the country. So outside was all there was. And I would kind of just run around and like pretend, you know? Yeah. I think that's where it kind of started. And I've kind of talked about a little bit about this in past Ramblemancies, but there's different like ways to get there, like through different avenues, like mm -hmm. playing with clay or drawing telling a story that way so i think yeah. that's yeah i'm i'm trying to think now like if i'm going for like impact see as much as it's it's not it's not uh, we've talked about this off off uh off stream before but like as much as it's uh it sucks these days to be to like give uh the author of these books credit for anything um <laughs> Uh, honestly like harry yeah. potter i is, know where you're going yeah, harry potter this. is the thing is are the books that like got mm -hmm. me into reading which like because yeah. as the, as they were coming like my mom and i would read them together and so that as we were reading them like we were reading them as they were coming out like i think only the first three were out when i started reading harry potter and then um like while we were waiting for books um like for the books to come out then we were like oh we we need to read more things and so then that like got us looking for other stuff to branch out to and like read and then of course the uh the uh classic thing that happens to young readers is that reading uh with the parent turns into the parent falling asleep and then i would get frustrated and steal the book and read ahead um and then <laughs> later on Love pretend that. i hadn't done that um and then eventually i just sort of cut out the middle step and just read books by myself and like that's what kind of launched me mm -hmm. into uh that and then of course from a, developing a love of reading then I developed a love of writing and that's you know the rest as they say is history um but yeah so honestly I would have to say that that's like that is uh probably mm -hmm. there are probably some of the most influential stories and like the last when we were talking about this off stream I don't know if you were still there, Olivia, but when, when we were doing, when we were talking about this, but um, <clears throat> actually I think it was after last Ramble Mancy that we were talking about this, um, where uh, that basically um, I've integrated a lot of what I, what I learned from um, the author of those books uh, writing style mm -hmm. into my TTRPG style. Into oh my, like, no, I, I think style. I was there when you said that. Were you that? there? Okay, then maybe yeah. it was a different time. But yeah, like the idea of like mm -hmm. of taking um, s small insignificant details and sprinkling mm -hmm. them in that later on become like hugely important to the to mm -hmm. the plot. Like that was a thing that I picked up from those. So like that I think was uh, if we're going by most influential, I would say that. But those books did lead me to Lord of the Rings, which mm -hmm. you know. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I have a story of Lord of the Rings impacting my life, but it was more because my aunt who would babysit me a lot was like a big super fan. So, mm -hmm. so I just like her love of it really made me interested in storytelling, but I, I didn't particularly connect to Lord of the Rings itself mm -hmm. that when I was young, it was more of like, I liked that she liked it kind of thing. So that definitely made me look to it, but I think, um, the book series that really made me excited was um I don't know if every I don't know how many people have read these but the series of unfortunate events like I read them with my mom yeah. she used to read them to us every night um and I think it really like my sense of humor can is shaped sometimes from that <laughs> um 
and I re like I re like of course like what a lit major thing to say like series of unfortunate events like it's very um lots of influences but that one was a really big one for me and then Teen Titans was another big one because hmm. I watched that show growing up as a yeah. kid and it it was like I think the first superhero thing that I really fell in love with hmm. uh and um that that made me interested in that genre which which has led to a lot of great media and storytelling so um i would yeah. say those are the, the main ones yeah i will say that i was sort of more more thinking of books so if we're going outside of that then i would say that then like the the largest influence is probably star wars because mm-hmm. i actually was into star wars before i was into harry potter so I was also going to say Lost, but I didn't want to start fighting with you. Lost was probably one of the biggest impacts. So I'm going to bow out. I'll be back and like <laughs> take care of that. I'll be right back. I'll t- take yeah. about 20. <laughs> Freeman wants just, no part of this. It was, I think it was one of the first pieces of media that I ever saw that was character driven in such a heavy way like that, mm-hmm. where so much of the drama and tension came from like supernatural mirroring internal struggles and that's something that i really love in all Mm. forms of media um when like the outward is kind of reflected in the inward struggle of the character as well so that's what i took from that that's interesting see because so there's a so there's an article that john and i are are particularly fond of um by i believe it's stephen r donaldson Mm -hmm. um who uh basically talks about like fantasy and fiction Mm -hmm. um yeah okay john confirms it is um that basically talks about how like the difference between fantasy and fiction is that fantasy is what you just described right Mm -hmm. which is the like the world sort of being manifestations of the internal struggles of the characters Mm -hmm. um and they deal with their internal struggles metaphorically by dealing with the external manifestation Mm -hmm. of those things um, well, where, good fantasy should do that. Right, good fantasy should do that. <laughs> and then fiction, on the other hand, is the opposite. Fiction is where each character represents a facet of the world that they exist mm. in. Um, fiction takes the takes the the macro view, I suppose, where it's making it's ma- it's like the characters are meant to make a statement about the world in which they exist. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really interesting description. Or a, de- or a description is. of those of those two genre, like one is sort of a subgenre of the other, but like I think that's a very clever analysis. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting article. I think I have it bookmarked, and I can send it to you later if you want. Yeah. I'll even post it in the Discord if people are interested, or John can do that because I know he's al- almost certainly already doing it. I can, um, I can <laughs> hear I can hear the keys <laughs> clicking. The speed. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. No. It's it's very interesting. And like those of you who are familiar with Matt Colville, um, and his videos, he actually does a whole video specifically refer- talking about that article by Stephen R. Donaldson, where he and kind of giving his take on that that uh difference. So you can find that's another uh perspective on this topic as well. But yeah. No. Like I. That's interesting. I've never really thought about Lost that way because frankly, I was not cognitively. Uh, developed enough at the time that I was watching Lost to think more of it than just a ah, TV show. Cool. Right? Like, so that is, um, that is something that, damn it, Olivia, are you, are you gonna just like, is this just Olivia convinces Lucas to like go back to <laughs> Oh Lost? man, this I, is something I've been thinking about too. I just, I'm just saying like, I have, I was a super fan of Lost. Like I used to watch it when I was a teenager. Like I would watch season one through season six and then like rewatch it. Like I was really obsessed with it. So like I have, it's a very dear place in my heart. Mm-hmm. So I'm a little biased, but I do think that it has some really, really interesting storytelling that it does in a, in a way that I have not ever ever seen again like see my thing is i'm just not sure that i could quite get past that like early early 2000s era of of tv writing it's kind of campy like it's a little cheesy but i don't know if i would call it campy specifically but there there are just certain like there are certain patterns that writing took in of tv writing took in that time that just it's it makes me cringe (laughs) 
<laughs> well, yeah, I think it had some bad impacts on the genre, but not that's it. It worked for itself. Yeah. You know, it's like sure, a period sure. of time where for like Nickelodeon, where I Carly got really popular. And then every show <laughs> after that was like XD so random, but it was never as funny kind of mm-hmm. thing. It's, yeah like that no yeah. I'm, I'm definitely seeing seeing good like good arguments here on both sides so if i'm being Freeman, a moderator Fre- here Freeman's just like oh shut God. the fuck up you guys just move on well, we can, we I, can take any on. storytelling question but i'll keep stalling until you no know, i will do i will say this much about lost is uh, it was just poor timing i did end up watching the whole thing once it was on netflix i watched i binged it because i could but I was really sick of the whole like, oh, you have to wait a week now. So, meh. Yeah. <laughs> and the people I watched it with too also kind of made a huge difference. But that's fair. Yeah, I. Uh... <laughs> Man, chat has moved way faster than I have. I know. Been I able can't. To keep I up cannot. I, I, so back. I. Um... I did want to say I did like. Uh, I think Koala said. Uh, Peter Pan. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. I did see that flip yeah. by some some long, and that made me think of. Uh, and Peter Pan, um, I think it just it made me think of uh, uh, um, the, what's the Peter Pan, the one with uh, oh gosh, are you talking about Hook? Oh yeah, Hook. I love that so much. That's a good Peter Pan story. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love that movie so much. <laughs> um, I also saw something else that that Koala said that I thought was was good, um, which was. Uh, in response to the, like the the distinction between, or uh, in response to specifically the definition of of fantasy given by Stephen R. Donaldson, uh, that's mm. a smart way to write writing a specific scenario for this uh, not for the sake of that scenario but for what it represents. And yeah, like that's, I mean, that is uh, if, I mean, for, I think about it in terms of in terms of TTRPGs, right? When I write fantasy, when I'm writing like uh, like D and D or something like that. I tend to do that. Like Freeman, you you could probably vouch for this that when when we're doing sort of like personal arcs for like characters, they tend to have um like whatever they're struggling with internally tends to manifest itself in some way in like the scenarios that they confront. Absolutely. And like that it's just a it's it's a very mm. handy shorthand mm-hmm. for like Definitely, like uh, characters grappling with uh, with like their own personal struggles. It's mm-hmm. very, very handy shorthand. Um, like a good example is in, is like in Critical Role Campaign One. Spoilers if you haven't seen Campaign One, but it's kind of on you at this point. Um, yeah, it's been years. It's been years. <laughs> uh, but like during during the the Chroma Conclave arc, right at the end Ooh, of it, when when uh, when Vax <clears throat> Vax kills Thordak, the dragon that was responsible for like killing their mother um that is metaphorically that is vax processing and overcoming his trauma right Mm -hmm. that's him overcoming or like processing it in a way right it's yeah and that's why that blow feels so good and has all that power behind it it's the literal dragon that represents the metaphorical dragon (laughs) right the dragon is a metaphor (laughs) right (laughs) Uh, but yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I miss some, feel like we missed some questions here, didn't we? Oh my we? god, I'm sure we did. Uh, we were just caught up. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> oh. Let's see, um, it was the dragon friends we made along the way. Also, hello, Amethyst Cat Lady. Welcome. Um, <laughs> the writers for that show are great. <laughs> yeah you know the, those those critical role writers they're they they really do a good job they you know they <laughs> <laughs> um oh my gosh i like sorry my brain just went into full shutdown mode because now i'm just like reading chat i know well Drupando you know i'm literally scrolling like okay, a other question in here i know i don't know Drupando and did say uh, question what makes a story mm. that was one i scrolled upon and i did just write it down so i could put it in my my brain here to mold that over what makes a story for sure what makes a story is that it's it has to have a beginning a middle and an end i'm sorry i don't actually believe that just go fuck yourself with it so no i want to put the uh middle and the beginning the end at the end 
Or I mean, they ended to be middle in the. Oh, never mind. I. Oh, you mean memento? Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Uh... You know what, though? Actually, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of true. <laughs> At least my that's my analysis of that yeah. film. Yep. Broke my brain. Uh... No, I don't know. I have to think on that one though. I think a story. I don't know. A story is a very like kind of vague, vague term, but it's fair. I think the set like the essential quality of a story is that it has to like there has to be something that's happening there has to be a conflict and there has to be some kind of movement whether it's an internal movement an external movement um even if it's if it's some stillness i feel like that's usually a subversion of stories like if you have a story like i don't know the one i thought of is like waiting for godot but that's a really like niche example like any story where you're like in in a place of stillness i feel like is usually like there's something weird going on like something's being represented so i feel like movement is really essential um in in to make a story Hmm. yeah or to make a good story it's true um I, that's kind of a vague answer so i have to think more <laughs> yeah there is um there is a good um a good example that i have of of a movie that i watched for a class in college that was just terrible but i can't remember the name of it and that's frankly okay with me like 99% of the time. But when I actually need to recall it to like make a point, um, it is a little less convenient. But it was a movie. I think I've even talked about this on Ramble Mancy before, like a long time ago. Um, but it's a movie that essentially was like a photographer who, when he's like developing his film, um, acts like he f- realizes that he's taking he's taking pictures in a in a park and he um, when he's developing his film he finds that there is that he has photographed what appears to be a dead body um oh my gosh and then he starts like he goes back to the park and doesn't find anything like has read nothing about it and just is like going around um like kind of starts to unravel after a while because like he starts to unravel this like conspiracy or whatever and then at the end you find out like he goes back to look at his photos and there's no body in them and the whole thing was like it ends so abruptly and randomly with nothing having changed like it like leads you through the whole process of a story but then at the end was like actually just kidding none of that was was in there and then it just like ends abruptly with no no resolution there's no resolution of any kind no explanation and i was angry at the end of that movie that Um, sounds like a movie that my old roommate who's a film major would show me and i would hate it absolutely it's absolutely the kind of film Hmm. that that like appeals to um people in film see now this is yeah i really wish that i remembered it was like a david lynch movie or something it kind of had that same vibe it like mulholland drive it honestly might have even been but i'll i'll have to like go and look it up because i'm (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah it sounds like it though what do you guys think makes a story i gave my answer anybody have any thoughts i'm just not smart enough to answer <laughs> that i have to tell you i disagree <laughs> with the words make a story they make outside i think stories don't have to have words i've seen dances that tell whole stories or seen a painting yeah. that tells a whole story exactly like i was gonna say like visual art can also tell a story photography can tell a story um yeah I understand you're just trying to be clever, but I'm just saying. <laughs> I will say, though, that yeah. like written, like uh, a copied format of a story can be very handy, assuming it makes it through the ages. Yeah. That's something I've, I, I really wish I could just find some like hidden document or hidden book buried like miles under a desert and just like learn something that we knew. But it's like, dude, is that, was that real? Was that just myth? I want to find yeah. the hidden some hidden secrets. Yeah, I also think like for the most part, I agree with 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 uh, with what you said, Olivia, with your with your thing. I would also add that on some level, a story has to connect with something. With something, it has to speak to the human experience, right? Like that. I think on some level, that's that's 
a because if you're not I mean I guess it doesn't have to but if it doesn't then what are you even doing like why are you doing it yeah like what's the point yeah like, yeah I know what you mean you're like sometimes like it, it's just recounting events and they could be made up events but like if it doesn't speak on some level to something in the human experience then it's just facts but you're not telling a story you're just relaying facts um so yeah I don't know that like I I think that's what I would I would mm-hmm. say yes to everything Olivia said but also add to that mm-hmm. that what I said that um a story is a yearning is a soul yearning for purpose. That's really cool, Rose. Whoa. <laughs> That's cool. Um Asia Fit says a story <laughs> connects head to heart, emotions become details. Ooh, that's cool. Um Yeah, 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 yeah. Hesson makes a good point though. Watching an ant drag a scrap of food can be a story if you connect. And that makes me that's yeah. that's true. Like you Here's the thing how you of, frame it. It's also the framing. Exactly. Here's the yeah. thing about 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 us humans is that we like patterns and stories mm-hmm. are patterns in so many ways and we <laughs> like to frame everything. We understand everything from a like very self-centered position, right? Like when we talk about uh when we like uh personify objects, right? Like when we <laughs> like anthropomorphize our like our like <laughs> Um, f- the fucking table that you stubbed your toe on, and you're like, "Fuck you," right? Or like, or like, right, you know, right. something falls over, and you're like, "Seriously, you're gonna do this to me right now?" Right? Like that kind uh-huh. of thing. It's be- it's like it com- it stems from like us mm. framing everything around us from our own weirdly selfish perspective, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So like, Hessen's right, point right. is actually it's very interesting, right? Because you can take something mm. where there's objectively speaking it's not a story it's just a creature doing what it does to survive and and what it is driven to do and yet we as humans look at that and attach our own human we, yeah we, to we it. make it into a story yeah yeah there's something <laughs> there's something rather narcissistic about that <laughs> narcissistic as no. so much as like it's our only lens of understanding sure, yeah, because absolutely. we can never understand what it feels like to be a tiger but if we identify with the fact that you know a tiger got its food stolen by a scavenger or something you mm-hmm. know you might relate to have that to an experience you you know with someone had a being robbed or something you know that's just like a weird example yeah. but like I feel like it does it does make sense and I think it's kind of endearing. I think it's a very endearing human trait to yeah. to want to apply <laughs> stories and situations where like it might not have happened that way, but it's like I don't know. I think I think it's more interesting. I think it makes things more exciting. Yeah. That's that is true. And like I this is I'm thing. just trying to battle the cynicism. Oh no, I wasn't meaning it <laughs> I I wasn't meaning it as like a like we're so <clears throat> terrible. Humans are bad because we no, make know, everything yeah. about us i was more just being like uh hyperbolic and facetious mm-hmm. about it but um but no like this is absolutely like a thing right like this is uh, when i was when i was in college right like i traveling back and forth during breaks between home and school i was in a lot of airports and i didn't have a whole lot happening in those airports and often i would have to wait for quite some time so i'd just sit there and i'd make up stories about the people walking around me like right like Mm-hmm. that's um people watching yeah people watching i would just like make up stories about the <laughs> um just based on like the little details i don't know i just yeah it's something that we it's something that we do it's part of i heard um pat rothfuss say something interesting like a long time ago which was that like as far as we know to the best of our understanding of um just the way that our world works humans are one of the things that separates us from other animals on on this planet is the fact is our ability to engage with fiction our ability to engage with stories right like narrative is hugely important to the human experience right like that is Mm -hmm. that is how we understand our entire existence right like going back to like uh you know 
early, early days of humanity, like the way we made sense of our world is by making shit up, right? Like things we couldn't explain. Well, clearly it was gods making things, right? Like putting Mm -hmm. the sun in the sky every day, right? Like that is, it's what we do. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. I I didn't have anything particularly profound to say about that. It was just an it was just an observation. Mm-hmm. No, I liked it. Hmm. <clears throat> um, sorry, jumping back to to chat here because I saw something. Let me scroll up because I saw it uh, a while ago. Um. Okay, Hessen says there needs to be tension, but it does not need to be resolved. And I, th- hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that for sure in a, in a story. Go ahead, Olivia. I was just going to say, I think that the tension, if it's, if it's, um, if there's power in the tension, I would say yes. I think that like some stories, people leave them unfinished because they don't have anything else to say, even if it doesn't have closure. But I think sometimes there can be a really productive tension mm-hmm. in, in kind of an unresolved story. Yeah. That's very true. Because I know that some of the some of the most profound endings to stories that I have that I have seen, read, or whatever are those that where there's no like end point, right? It doesn't end. Mm-hmm. It's like happily ever after, right? Forever and ever. Mm-hmm. Um but it like it leaves it open ended, but with a clear idea of like the direction the story is taking because but it's but like the mm-hmm. like the, the conclusion of the story isn't the point of those stories it's often mm-hmm. like i don't know I'm, i don't know what i'm trying to say i like, think I, it, it shows a level of trust in the reader too like i hate when stories underestimate the reader by like having to button everything up like yeah. i think epilogues are almost always terrible i think epilogues <laughs> almost always like i hate like i i, I haven't read yeah. many that i like because I think it's, they're almost always unnecessary. They're over-explanatory and you don't need them. But that's because I, I don't know, I'm a there sucker for the last image. You yeah, know? there we go. This is, Koala is, I think, putting words to what I was trying to say, which is leaving mm-hmm. it unanswered because there is no answer or an answer would seem cheap and would take away from the point. Yes, that's. Perfect. That's, yes. yes. Thank exactly. you. Exactly. Thank you for that. Yeah, that that is what I was very clumsily trying to get my, get to. But yeah, that's what I was trying Thanks to say. Art- thank you, Koala. <laughs> Um, Nico says, okay, let me try to put it into words. Story is an expression of idea and or emotion. Does that work? I mean, I suppose, but there's also some level of, there is some level of narrative to it though, right? Like on some, hmm, on some level, you can't have a story without narrative, whether it's implied or explicit. I don't, I don't know. know. Narrative is a tricky word. It not is. to not to get all English major on you, but that's <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose it's if you're looking for a concise definition, I suppose it is it is a fair definition, Nico. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's. One I of feel those... like there's no okay. one answer. Everyone's answer is valid. Ow. I'm, I'm fine. fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Alive. Are you okay? Did yep. you just like hit against something? I did. It's oh. fine. <laughs> okay. Everything's fine. Um. Hessen says, a tongue-in-cheek answer, but my father said once, we make up stories to answer the annoying questions from our kids going, why, a thousand times a day? <laughs> That's a very wise dad statement. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, ooh, interesting, Koala. Koala says, that's why storytelling in TV shows almost always goes downhill the more oh. sequels slash seasons there are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I could see that. Totally right. Yeah, because after a while, like the long, like, like a show keeps going, Ugh. and it keeps you keeps having to answer questions 
because otherwise there's no point to the story. But the more questions you answer, like the the le- the cheaper it becomes. That's I never thought of it that way, but yeah. I I think that so many I don't know I think that shows when they go on for too many seasons can kind of lose sight of the heart of their show um, and like the reason why it's good because they're kind of trading it in for like plot like they want to tie up the plots um, and I think that can be a really big problem um, yeah plus I think of I think of how I met your mother as a prime example of oh. that um, like if I had to point oh, to any media that did that like that points to that the worst oh boy that one uh yeah I don't okay even... yeah supernatural is also one um buffy Although, here's, buffy here's what is I, will one. Say. I will say about supernatural i'm i'm not i will say that yes you're absolutely correct in that but i, I would also never s- defend supernatural but i but i will also say that they are the only <clears throat> series that I think has gone in that direction that has slightly, ma- that I know of anyway, that has slightly managed to come back. Like, not all the way, but has, like, come back. For, like, it's done, it it did it did this, and then it sort of did this, and then went down, and then came kind of back up. They, like, re- redirected it at a certain point, right? Because they were doing the thing where they're, like, they made the mistake, the classic mistake, that the story, the progression of the story uh, lies in escalation, Right, except at a, they they did the Dragon Ball Z thing basically, where it's like it's the most powerful being in the universe, and you have to fight him. It's like oh, I've we've, I've defeated him. Oh, well now there's an even more powerful being in the yeah. universe. It's a, it's right? stakes. It's, it's a stakes right. thing. And then yeah. eventually they did they did they got to a point where they're like okay, well there's nowhere else to go. There's no there's no higher to that we can go, uh, while still keeping a coherent story so they actually brought it back down they brought this like the they kept the Mm -hmm. stakes high but they like lowered the actual like threat right so it's not like so they're like oh we're just fighting a lowly demon and then like oh it's an even worse demon and then oh the thing that came before the demons and then like it just kept going up but then at a certain and until finally they're like we fought basically the universe itself and then like right. what do we where do you go from there and what and they actually did a solid job of coming back from that point to to in a in a level at a level that was not like just extremely cheap that said it is not supernatural the show was at no point free and clear of this particular problem that we are talking about here but yeah, yeah. Ooh. yeah uh, stakes is a problem for so many shows where they just kind of don't they either they don't exist or they are very like i don't know you you just like lose sight of of why why the characters are even doing anything yep uh. yeah it gets gets pretty easy to like come well and then you add to that the fact that oh, sorry hmm you add to that the fact that um, on a lot of shows, what also happens is that the writers change. Mm-hmm. Like one of the highest turnovers of any position in entertainment media is writers, <laughs> right? Oh, wow. So like oh, you, yeah. you add to that, like everything that we talked about, which is like the natural intrinsic issues in storytelling and TV mm-hmm. shows. And then you add the the whole, the, cha- the change in the people who are actually writing them. I think Doctor Who is a really good example oh, of that. Yes. I know in, because the quality would vary so much and probably still, I haven't, I haven't watched the, like the last few seasons, but I remember like at the heyday of Doctor Who, it was, you know, there would be a ton of discussion around who had written what episodes because yeah. it was so clear in the writing, like when it was one way, you know, like it was so clear yeah. when a writer who was not good was writing it. Yeah um no it's it's very true and man i now now that we're talking about this like i really want to have an episode of ramblemancy exclusively dedicated to to doctor who we'll have drac come on and we'll just like that sounds fun we'll just talk about we'll just talk about doctor who and like all the things that we love about it and all of the things that we're very sad about um there's a lot of both of those things um 
Anyway. <laughs> um, okay. Nika says, speaking of power ex- uh, escalation, watch Gurren Lagann. It makes power escalation its whole meta narrative and is really fascinating. Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> That's I don't think I've heard me of this. Me neither. Uh, what's Doctor Who? I only know Nurse What. <laughs> That's fair. Um, yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm trying to think now of like other... I know generally speaking I have like a lot of stuff. The pro- See, the problem with Ramblemancy <laughs> is that I... I often will have a lot of things to say on this on the topic, but mm-hmm. I am being forced to come up with them on the spot. What and is so it you you're forget. talking? So I forget, right? What like, was what was the subject? Like other media? Because I I had some other no, media. We, no, I'm talking about like just in general, right? In general. Like, like about different like, different things about storytelling. Yeah, right, right. Like if we were on. if we were going to yeah. have a conversation about this, I'd be like, all right, here's my here's my opinions about storytelling mm-hmm. and about how it's done well and badly. Um, but right now, because there's no context building up to it, <clears throat> I'm just trying to like come up with my my thoughts. Just make it's, a fact. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> make <fun>. a content. <laughs> it's hard to do it that way because there's no yeah. context. Anyway, hmm. um, <laughs> before rolling, I have infinite ideas. Camera comes on. No, uh, no ideas. Correct. That's correct. <laughs> um, I'm infinite sorry. Infinite horizon of ideas. It's also getting very warm in here again. So I need to go open my door again. One sec. Oh, to let the cool air through. It's cool here, so. I think if something, I, I don't know if I saw Drac tweeted or I saw, maybe I saw him reply to it, but um, mm. someone was talking about how they love the storytelling, like kind of framing device where it starts with like a parent or like someone telling a story to a kid or something. Um, or, you know, you're starting by telling them a bedtime story um, and that kind of framing device. Um, and they were saying how it was their favorite. And I just, I wanted to say that I love that framing device and I think it's such a cute way to tell a story is to frame it mm-hmm. as a bedtime story. Absolutely. It's one of the first places you hear a story. Mm-hmm. So it automatically has a lot of power behind it, I think. And that's how they, I think that's how the princess, that's the princess bride right exactly, there. Exactly, yeah, it's the princess bride thing, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that too. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah I saw Rose mention the princess bride. Oh, that. nice. Yeah. I just saw that too, nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely true. Uh, like Gemini the... Lightning is trying to get me to talk about tarot and poems. I'm like, whoa, targeted, <laughs> targeted attack there. That is though that that is an important thing to bring up though. Um, that in... is one. I don't even know where to start with that. Where did yeah, give, me a, give me a question? Okay, I've got something, mm. and this is <laughs> this may be a little bit of a little bit of a hot take. It's not so much of a take, it's because it is a question, but how much, Olivia, do you see the interaction between, uh, between like, um, what I mentioned earlier about, like, humans needing to, like, recognize mm-hmm. patterns and being very, like, our brains being specifically wired to recognize patterns and, mm-hmm. like, people putting stock in things like tarot or, like, horoscopes mm-hmm. and things like that, right? I love this question okay, good. because I have a lot of thoughts about this question because I was actually asked something very similar by my aunt because she's very like skeptically minded mm-hmm. and and I've been getting really into tarot and she's like okay so like what and and um kind of horoscopes and um not like daily horoscopes but kind of like astrology signs yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff but um and I was saying how I think that tarot and um and things like astrology are very interesting because um, it's a different realm of understanding kind of knowledge in the world around us because you have you know, scientific methods of understanding the world, you have philosophical ways of understanding the world, and then you have kind of archetypal ways. And I think things like tarot and astrology really kind of dig into an archetypal understanding that like we as humans have passed down um, because I feel like tarot, astrology, those are things that are usually past in kind of families or in um like kind of intimate ways um you know like it's something that you learn from someone else typically um and so i think i think tarot is really interesting because you examine archetypes i actually have my tarot cards right here (laughs) 
Um, so I'm trying to find a good, a good one, but like, you know, like you look at this and it has a totally different meaning now than it would have had hundreds of years ago. And it's calling back to this kind of like feudalistic society where things have been kind of lost around around mm. us now, but you still gain an understanding because you say, oh, I know what a flower can represent. I know what someone on a throne, I know what the color gold, I know what gold is, you know, and you gain all these meanings from them. Um, and um, I, what was the question originally? I kind of just got, well, just, got off. <laughs> no, it's fine. Just That's in, perfect. Just like, <laughs> basically like what do you see as the relationship mm -hmm. between like the human need to recognize and understand patterns in the world around them uh -huh. um and like uh and like tarot and divination of, of various kinds. yeah i think tarot kind of fills exactly kind of a similar role as storytelling because it, it um only i think that tarot and in kind of things like astrology are lenses to help us understand the self mm -hmm. um, in the way that stories help us see ourselves reflected. So I think they serve similar purposes, but they're doing it in different ways. Um, I think would be kind of the way that I think about it. Right. Um, Cause like the thing for me was that, cause I, I tend to also be pretty like on the skeptical side. Right. Mm -hmm. So like for me, the thing, like the thing is that like, I think there's room for like both of these things right mm -hmm, within definitely. even within within skepticism right like mm -hmm. it like if if you like receive a tarot reading right and and you're like uh, and you uh attach it to things in your life like you re you get like the you like somebody gives you like a tarot reading and you start saying oh well that rem that's like this part of my life and that's this, exactly and this, right mm -hmm. right that kind of thing it's not that the it's not necessarily that like from in my mind like I think okay well that's the like the natural like human need to like recognize patterns to connect things mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily connected but to connect them and then mm -hmm. derive meaning from that connection uh -huh. uh, that may or may not be there but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's like empty and useless right like I think it's kind of like mm -hmm. what you were saying is it's like uh at the, it's a way it's something that brings to the surface these these things that makes you think a little more clearly about the things that are taking place that are objectively taking place in your life mm -hmm. and sort of reframing them in a, in a context that you might not have seen them before mm -hmm. I, I yeah I agree I think intuition is a really powerful like human experience and a human sense that a lot of people kind of ignore and I think tarot is cool because it can kind of help you tap into that that mm -hmm. intuition it's like on some level it can be sort of more of like a focusing thing rather mm -hmm. than like than like a like mystical or any or any kind yeah of like... yeah exactly and there are people that that are kind of more into the mysticism of it mm -hmm. um and I mean that's kind of its own whole separate realm um but I I don't know I think there's a lot to gain from just like kind of the long understanding of archetype and reinterpreting it um yeah. yeah i think poetry is an interesting topic because it's very um i think that storytelling works very differently in poetry than it works in things like novels or in ttrpgs or in in other realms because you have usually less space um and the narratives are very different um and so I think it's it's a very interesting way of telling stories that is very different from other other realms, uh, because you're not only expressing what's happening, you're expressing the feeling of what's happening, the sensation of what's happening, the 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 you know the um, the mood. Like you have to do all of those things while still telling some kind of story in in the poem. So I I I don't know. I love poetry, obviously, yeah. but I I want to say uh... that was my tangent. Age of Fit says, I would say that people use imagery of tarot reading to organize the current information they have to move in a specific direction going forward. And yeah, mm -hmm. that's that is that is a good way of of try, of putting concisely what I was saying. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. That's, that's very good. Uh, but yeah, um, no, I, I think when it comes to poetry, it's interesting, right? Because in poetry, I think it's a lot of the same elements of what make a story, but without the actual, uh, like there's no obligation to tell a story in poetry. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Like it's, it's interesting. Cause you could, you can legitimately just 
like so many poems that I've read over the years have been have been poems that all they do is just is just describe an image like mm-hmm. nothing is happening in it there's no tension there's no nothing it's just a scene or an image right like or an object even like descript it's descriptive there's poetry mm-hmm. that's purely descriptive um but like there's no obligation to tell a story with it or rather i'd say there's no obligation on the part of the reader to interpret a story from it Mm -hmm. right like you can look you can read a poem you you can uh and you can connect with it and think it's beautiful without Mm -hmm. have without like there's no obligation whatsoever for you as the reader to to like attach a story to it you probably Mm -hmm. will anyway because you're a human but and that's what we do but you don't have to and i think that that's and it's just as valid a way to read it as like you know not doing that like I think I had a professor one time and we were talking about the differences between um, poetry and then prose poetry, which Mm -hmm. is kind of coming back with kind of contemporary poetry. It's um, just not going to go too into it, but um, it's a little bit more popular now. And I think what she said about prose in general, it, it kind of relates to prose in general, is that with prose and kind of like fiction, um, you're not taking as big of a leap, you know, like you're, you have more rules and you have more, um, like there's more expectations that if you're reading a fiction story, like it, it, one sentence has to lead to the next, but with poetry, you kind of can suspend that. Um, and so I think that's a very interesting tension, especially if you read both. So I don't know, I would encourage everybody who hasn't read much poetry to hit me up for recommendations in the discord because I'm, I can, I'm pretty good at recommending because I don't know. Um, I but saw Nico had getting a couple, off my soapbox now. Nico had a couple of questions <laughs> that I think I, that I want to get to. Um, I'll mm-hmm. start with good. the more recent one first, which was, uh, Lucas, what can a GM do both while preparing? Uh, prepping and uh, prepping for and while running a game to help facilitate m- micro stories within the overarching narrative. Okay. So number one thing is to know what the point of the story you're telling is. Everything else it come can, will stem from there because if you can answer that one question, like why why am I telling this story? Um, then you can understand what needs to happen. Then you can start asking yourself the other questions. Uh, like, what needs to happen in order for me to get there? Um, everything after that is pretty much just dressing. Like, you know, like, mm-hmm. everything after that is just how you frame your story. And there's no rule for that. For that, it's it's entirely up to, like, what you feel is right for your story but what i will say is that when you when you know why you're telling a story it becomes much easier to figure out how to tell it Mm -hmm. you start with the thesis yeah (laughs) yeah exactly like that's and so i don't really have a more concrete answer than that like i i don't have anything as far as like practical tips for how to do that it's because a lot of it just comes from doing it enough to know, um, know who you're telling your, like, that's the other, okay. I will say that the the other side of this is know who you're telling the story to like, know who are you, who to like, to whom are you telling the story? Because that will also influence how you, how you frame it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's it's just a matter of knowing what you're trying to achieve and knowing who you're directing it at. Um, mm. So yeah, that's my answer to that. Um, and then Nico's <laughs> other question from earlier, what can we learn from other forms of storytelling like books, movies, games, etc., that we can apply to telling of stories in TTRPGs? Ooh, that's a good question. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I think my biggest one that I have taken away from those other things is pacing. Mm-hmm. 
pacing is a, is a, and and the importance of it. Because obviously you're not going to be able. That's a good to, answer. You're not going to be able to like pace your TTRPG the same way that a TV show is paced, but you can you can le- you can learn that from uh like yeah the importance of of pacing i guess and i sort of lost what i was saying in the middle of it so hmm. um okay huh. nico says right okay i think I, oh oh i was going to say i think something that i definitely like learn from as a player and as um in TTRPGs that I get from movies and books and different forms of media is how important it is to have connections between different characters and like having bonds is super important. Like, I think that that is what makes a game more engaging is if you have those relationships built. So um, I don't know, that's kind of a basic one, but that's what I definitely look at in movies and books and like try to bring into stories. Yeah. Freeman, I, I, you look like you had something to add. No, I'm trying to think of something, but I don't know. Like, I don't know. I would say it, hmm, it's it's not really my answer, but it certainly is one, could be one of them is like what kind of characters I like to play. Mm-hmm. I will, I will like, I don't know, yeah. So, are you saying know. that like the things like the like what you take away from like books and movies and t- and TV or is sort of like you or is stuff that you take away to like add or would like to a little bit yeah okay. yeah, yeah. yeah 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 I definitely think I think that's that's legit like that is I mean you I mean I'm playing a private investigator uh, in Infinite Horizon yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. the kind of media you enjoy you want to kind I'm, of emulate I'm taking, your yeah. characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that exactly. That, no, that's totally that's totally a legit answer. Um, I, mean, uh, I feel like that's kind of the basic premise of TTRPGs, which is <laughs> what makes them so fun. TTRPGs, uh, unlike a lot of storytelling mediums, thrive on cliches. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's because yeah. I mean it's improvised. You know, mm-hmm. you you can only be so clever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nico is clarifying his question from earlier, mm-hmm. which is right. Okay, I think you misunderstood my question. By micro stories, I don't necessarily mean story arcs or side stories. I mean the small moments that later become those stories you tell to your friends. I don't think that my answer changes actually, because um, intention matters regardless uh, of mm-hmm. of how broad the spectrum of story you're telling is. Right? Like if mm-hmm. you're if you're telling. If you're telling like a big, whether you're telling a big sweeping narrative or whether you're just talking about those sort of vignette moments, the little like the little moments that aren't um, that just sort of stick in your head as like a scene or like a comic panel or whatever it is. Either way, there's intention behind those scenes. And I th- it's it's I don't know that there's a way to get those. I think those moments tend to happen incidentally. Right. They tend to be incidental. But if you want to make them happen, then you have to, you have to make, uh, you have to make whatever you're putting into your scene. You have to make it align with intention, and for that, you need to know what your intention is. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Okay, actually, here is a good example from Infinite Horizon, which is the it's kind of the go-to example. To, it's the well that never dries up, right? In the early early Infinite Horizon, like this the street vendor scene on Sulan, right? Street mm-hmm. food. I had that is I think what you're referring to as micro story, right? Like it wasn't something that was it wasn't like there wasn't it was not a plot point. It was just something that was happening. It was incidental. It was along the way. And mm, the purpose behind putting that it, like we're constantly talking about it later, right? Like we we always refer back to the the street food scene. That was a moment uh, one of those micro stories that you're talking about that wasn't incidental that was purposeful and that one happened with the intention of creating a moment of calm in what was about to become a very very chaotic time it was about it was about inserting a small amount um 
to the audience, the other component that I that I mentioned, um, about what this world was like outside of the narrative taking place, right? Like, what is the world of Infinite Horizon like? Who are those people, uh, and like, and and what do regular people do? What is their what are their lives like? And that's what the in, the intention behind that scene is. So I actually don't think that my answer changes um, hmm. for you because basically for those micro stories, those micro moments that are just sort of vignettes that play in your mind, generally speaking, they they're incidental. They just kind of happen because you don't really have a lot of control over what sticks in your players' minds. But if you want to create those moments, manufacture them, then the only way to do that is through intention. So, yeah. Same answer, really. Um, huh. uh, let's see. I feel like there were a bunch of things that I missed in chat while I was going off about that. Uh, <laughs> um... Okay, Hessen actually has a response to, to Nico, which is, uh, I would say have good side characters that have their own stories the players can identify with and capitalize on mm. uh, in ways the players are connecting with each other and the world. Um, yes, I agree. I think that also matters, is having a strong base for those moments to happen, right? Like, think mm -hmm. again, back to intention, like thinking through... Um, like who are these npcs right like what do they want and what are they like yeah and then little things stem from that right like those moments will will sort of naturally come from knowing those things um and the same thing with your it's the same situation if you're talking about like the world right like a, like a, if you're doing like uh like a particular building or a uh an idea, a concept that exists in your world, right? Like knowing those things and being very intentional mm -hmm. with, the, with making those things. And then those moments mm -hmm. will just sort of naturally come. Yeah. I think not being, uh, this is just kind of, I think creating moments in general that are impactful without planning to, I think come from following impulses, even if you don't know where they'll end up. I think at first it can be a little hard to trust yourself in the scene at, at times if you're playing in a, like I've definitely had games where you play in and you're like, I don't really know where this is going. Like I'm kind of worried about where this scene is going to go. And then, but if, if you just kind of push past that feeling, I think that is where a lot of the best, the best like connective moments come in or like character building moments or things that are unexpected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I like um, this idea that Koala has. It says, uh, uh, she says, whether or not defying a trope is always good. That's something I think about a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes here's, this is my like, this is one of the most one of the most infuriating things that I kept coming across whenever I was in a creative writing class in college. Um, oh, don't get me started on this topic, Lucas. Look, creative writing classes. <laughs> get they, me started on this one. I'm gonna because I'm already there, so I'm dragging you in with me. Okay. But, okay. Um, and I'm just sandwiched in between two <laughs> English majors. <laughs> you can just talk about bad stories. It's applicable in in many other ways. <laughs> so like, so here's the thing: like, creative writing classes are intent are designed to like unless they are best like specialized classes they tend to be teaching the broad strokes mm -hmm. of creative writing and a thing that i struggled with a lot in those classes was the concept of clichés right which is like generally if you if you take your your creative writing classes at face value take them literally they will say cliches bad always, except that's not true, is it? Because cliches are cliches for a reason. It's because they are useful for something. Because if they weren't, then we wouldn't have them. They wouldn't be mm -hmm. cliches. So, like the way that I think about it, the way that I eventually came to think about it is cliches are bad only if you are using them lazily right if you're yeah, not if you're, like, mm -hmm. if you're not if you're if you if you are using them just sort of to be 
like to get around being intentional. <laughs> if you are using cliches intentionally to evoke whatever ideas people sort of collectively have attached to cliches, um, then that's where they become useful again. Yeah, I uh, would have a problem a lot when I was um, when I was in college, I was president of the creative writing club on campus. And so I like conducted, you know, lessons essentially. And I remember one time I brought in this poem that basically deconstructed the idea of heartbreak because I wanted everybody to try deconstructing cliches. But what happened is everyone just wrote cliches. Like they just, all of their, like, you know, four or five people read their stuff, you know, short, short mm -hmm. little snippets of whatever. And like, you know, a good, a good two thirds were, were people just kind of reiterating the cliches. And, and then they'd say, well, it's okay, because it was an intentional, like it was an intentional thing. Like I'm, I'm doing it ironically. And I'm like, it doesn't matter if you're intending to do it ironically, it still falls flat because you're not seeing anything new. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, it's Rose actually says it perfectly here. Defy the trope because you have something to say about the trope. Don't just break the mold to be edgy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with that. Because you have to like kind of defamiliarize the cliche so that you can kind of understand it again in a new way. I read this really awesome book called Written on the Body mm -hmm. by Jeanette Winterson, who's like a favorite author of mine. She's lesbian British. She's awesome. Um, and she writes an entire book about love. And it starts out saying like, I love you is the most cliche thing, but it's all we want to hear. Like it, it's all about kind of love and the cliches of love. Hmm. It's super interesting. Hmm. Um, interesting. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, like it, it, it actually weirdly, it took a rhetoric class act hilariously. It took a rhetoric class for me to get around the idea of cliches are bad. Right. Because mm -hmm. rhetoric classes, like a rhetoric class specifically will teach you. And that depends on what you're trying to accomplish. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it, like a cliche might be exactly the tool you need in mm -hmm. order to accomplish what you wanted, but to do, um, and that goes just as true in creative writing <laughs> as it does for like, you know, effective writing, like speech writing and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's just as true in creative writing. Um, I like um, Evajit's comment, irony is bullshit and lazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> in lots of ways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> John Numa, hello. Good to see you. Thanks for popping in. Um, oh, hey. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Rose says, cliches can be useful when you want something that won't shock and distract your audience from the point you're really trying to make. Yeah, that's true. Um, or like you said earlier, uh, Rose, that like if you're trying to make a point about the trope, because um, that's the thing that I find. Uh, so going back to Supernatural, <laughs> one of the things that early on made me like I was sort of like shaky about supernatural going into it i was like i don't know about this but one of the moments that sold me on supernatural is this moment where like they think they destroyed the ghost but it turns out there was a different ghost and uh, oh no and that and so they what they, an they, awkward they, mistake well, <laughs> and and it turns out that the one that they needed to get rid of uh like still has her remains as like part of a doll in the in the mausoleum, like hair was like part of her hair was used to make a doll. And it's like in the mausoleum. Oopsie. So like Dean has to like rush across back to the cemetery to like break in. And it's just this excellent moment, right? Where he's like, he takes the butt of his gun. And like, meanwhile, Sam and whoever they're with are like, they're in trouble, be, like fending off the ghost so to buy Dean time so he can do this. And uh, Dean takes the butt of his pistol and he just starts trying to break his way into the into the, like the plexiglass mm -hmm. like case where the mausoleum is. And like the very classic like horror tropes, right? Where they're like, I can't do it, whatever. And then there's this moment where he stops and he looks at the gun. He's like, come on, Dean. And he turns it around and just shoots the plexiglass. <laughs> <laughs> and that was sold from that moment on i was like all right i'm in <laughs> because it just like defied the trope of people being mm -hmm. intent like intentionally stupid for the sake of uh, mm -hmm. like fa um creating a facsimile of drama right mm -hmm. like manufacturing drama by doing things that nobody would ever do and then it like built up that trope and then it called it out in the same moment and it was and like that yeah like it got you somewhere funny like yeah. that's you know it was a vehicle yeah exactly and like i think that is very clever 
like when you can when you can you know build the trope and then subvert it it's not but it doesn't always work and it's not a thing you should always do because mm-hmm. <sighs> anyway because not, it can be gimmicky it can be it a can, gimmick it can be yeah. gimmicky but it can also lose your audience mm-hmm. right if you yeah. do the thing that is unexpected intentionally because it is unexpected you can totally lose it's, your audience oh it's like Westworld. Ugh, yes yeah. <laughs> i love that show but like that's what you know, I like it, but it's also I'm like, ugh, you're trying too hard to be pretentious. Like, calm down. Like, yeah. <laughs> relax. Yeah, absolutely. Ugh. Oh man. Yeah, I have a lot of opinions about storytelling. Yeah, does are, are there many more storytelling questions? Freeman, I feel like you've been wanting to say something for a while. Like, not necessarily about the same, the subject that we've been, mm-hmm. like, running off on, but just in general about stories. Yeah. Oh. Well. It's, um, well. It it can go, it's a deep, it's as deep, it can be as deep as... Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I was actually going to say was, I had a thought about just an example of, like, because we were talking about other forms of media that we inspired us in stories that were not just TTRPGs, but like mm-hmm. um, one of them was Robin Hood for me. Mm-hmm. I think that then led me to Green Arrow. And I think, I think now, and this is not too difficult, honestly, because I'm kind of, I'm kind of sick of Batman specifically. The Bat Family, I, I the Bat Family sure, is yes. cool, right? We love the Bat Family because we don't see them enough. I, yeah. I think that Green Arrow, I think that Oliver Queen has taken over the position in, for me uh-huh. as my favorite, like, vigilante, because I like... I know this is not quite on the topic mm-hmm. of storytelling, but I do like the hero that's not who doesn't have like super abilities they've just become they've just become a better version of themselves through extreme circumstances mm-hmm. yeah no there definitely yeah. there definitely is something compelling about like that kind of character right the kind who it's kind of it's i think it's kind of like a if one it's kind of like a fantasy i think of mm-hmm. all of us you know mm-hmm. like it's a fantasy to like see someone who's that good at you know martial arts or whatever you know yeah mm-hmm. and like but, oh go ahead oh well, i was just thinking like and and we see that kind of thing happen in stories all the time right like rocky and the training montage or like the oh, karate yeah. kid or um uncle iro in in prison right when he's like <gasps> yeah you know like we see that all Buff the time like ex- extreme circumstances mm-hmm. sort of forcing people through the crucible that la- leads them into a like a better more like polished and refined version of themselves like i think that's yeah like yeah there's something that i think is very like we find we as consumers of stories find compelling about that specific kind of definitely Mm -hmm. it's like why we like the genius trope you know Mm -hmm. like we love genius characters um i uh i think that batman as a story too doesn't really resonate as much with us right now because yeah yeah. (laughs) like a rich guy who doesn't really stop crime in an effective manner he just you know like it... criminals and sends them to the police who like do nothing and i know i'm like cool they're making money <laughs> off of this by locking up poor people like it just it doesn't like it doesn't jive with me right now <laughs> yeah no listen i have said it before and i will say it again superheroes the way they are fed to us in uh, in pop culture are agents who who serve the Propa- status quo propaganda yeah. Yeah. it's american propaganda yes. kids they they serve only the status quo including the vigilante heroes because I mean, what, what do the vigilante yeah. heroes do all they do is they go after like the symptoms of the problems right like the mob bosses and the like the like the street level criminals and whatever that's what they do except mm-hmm. we know we as uh, as intelligent consumers uh, know that the uh, the actual root of those problems is the billionaires and corporations. Corporations. <laughs> 
what's the line you said on the game last night or oh. the other night the if you're not if, what is it if you're not paying attention if you're, if you're not anti-corporate you're not paying attention that's what yeah. it was it's true i yeah. want a shirt that says that yeah <laughs> yeah no and like uh, you can actually perfectly see like not to make this like too real but you can perfectly see it today right with like fucking jeff bezos and the whole like the whole like stepping down as like uh like the uh, CEO or whatever of mm-hmm. Amazon and going off to do like, and now he's like focusing on his like, you know, more like, I don't, charitable is the wrong word, but like more, like uh, more socially focused programs and things like that. Sure. But those are all things that he, those are like, there's something that he's doing that has to do with like homelessness and whatever, but except that mm-hmm. like Amazon has done so much more damage to those things before and so like now what he's doing is like yeah i guess it's addressing kind of issues of homelessness but and like Mm -hmm. uh, affordable housing and things like that but amazon has done damage to those things already so like anyway yeah 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 yeah. he's like some isn't he like spending time with like some kind of space program too of some kind or something maybe i don't fucking know know. it's (laughs) you know you know you're rich when you can like spend time with other planets you know it's just (laughs) crazy yeah (laughs) That's how you know you're rich. Yeah, where you can ignore this planet that you're on, that you literally live like... on. And look at the other ones. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Focusing on downloading his brain into computers. Yeah, that one. Oh, God. He's uh, going to, like, dollhouse style download his brain into another body or something. Uh, <sighs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, anyway. There is another question up here about storytelling. Oh, dear, it was Nico. Um, that's about nonlinear storytelling. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. Uh, hmm. I like nonlinear storytelling, um, as long as it's done in a way that I it doesn't matter that we're confused. Like I don't like nonlinear stories where like you don't know what's happening and that's a problem. Um, but I, I love a good, um, a good nonlinear story. Uh, I think it's exciting. Well, Koala um, asked a question that I was going to ask too, is what, it, what, ex, what's an example of a I have an answer. Um, the Witcher on Netflix is a good example of nonlinear storytelling. Oh goodness. You're right. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, do, do you mean like episodic or like, I, I was thinking more specifically like jumps around in time. Specifically. Sure. That too. Like Memento is also a good example of nonlinear mm-hmm. storytelling. That's right. Oh, I had so much um, trouble. Yeah. Um, actually, Lucas, you had to tell me how the Witcher was worked, how the Witcher was working. I know it took me a for me to actually to figure that out. <laughs> it's like, oh, thank you. I get it now. <laughs> Geek Out says, I disagree, Lucas. About what? About The Witcher? Uh, I don't... Okay. Uh, please do explain. Um, I mean, I guess it is, like, linear in the sense that, like, all of the events, regardless of which time they are taking place in, are all, like, moving in kind of a linear fashion, but, like, the scenes themselves are not linear because it's never made clear when it's flashback and when it's present Mm -hmm. so yeah no that would be that would make sense Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what i would think too but yeah Uh... i i also am a sucker where like for a framing device where you're like starting at the end and then the person's telling the story um and then like you end the book or the story at the same place you started i love a good device like that i just love a button ending um right oh hmm. also yeah like the where it's cyclical or ton- cyclical tons of tv shows have like that episode where it starts off in a crisis like totally yeah. no context yeah. and something in horrible media res. happens and then it flashes it's like 36 hours earlier right like that kind of <laughs> and then that moment becomes like the climax of the episode when you come back around through it in linear mm-hmm. fashion right like that's um yeah john newman says enterprise episodes 48 hours earlier yeah exactly um yeah um uh, i think those are yeah, so these are examples of non-linear. I think they can be very compelling and powerful if they're done in a way that's like that serves some purpose. Um, 
that serves the story as a whole, right? Like if you're just mm -hmm. doing nonlinear story, there is <laughs> there is an entire genre of films that I'm just like that that I despise, and it's that genre. It's not. I wouldn't even call it a genre. It's just sort of like a uh, category. I would say of films that like where they are very difficult to follow but the creators of the film made it difficult to follow on purpose and are trying to pass that off as very intelligent and deep. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, like if there's not substance to it. Like Memento. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just... It's like Crash. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, I feel like in... Not this is not an example of nonlinear storytelling. It's more just an example of the what I just said, which is uh, Inception. Um, mm. Like they try to pass that off as just like as really deep and like making some kind of point about something, but it's extremely pointless. It's extremely shallow, and it's just hard to follow. Like that's that's my favorite question to ask about a movie: is like, is this movie deep and poignant, or is it just hard to follow? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good question to ask. I have to get my friend who's a who was studied film in college to explain a lot of movies to me mm -hmm. because I'll watch something and I'll be like, "What's the thesis of this? I don't understand. Yeah. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to get from this." And then he'll explain it to me, and I'll be like, "Oh, okay. I understand now. I like it." Yeah. Um, okay. So Geekouts is explaining The Witcher is an example of bad nonlinear storytelling uh, because the cast doesn't age. And the one character that does does age does so so subtly that most people had no idea about the time differences until the last few episodes. Like it works if the reveal is obvious. It wasn't until much after the reveal. I agree with everything that you said, but I don't know that I agree that that makes it a bad example of nonlinear storytelling. I'm not sure that it does make it I think a bad the, example. I think his following question too, given the chaotic nature of dice rolls and their impact on narrative of a game, do you think running a nonlinear narrative in a TTRPG is, let's say, advisable? I don't know about a whole narrative, but moments. Mm -hmm. Right? Like I mm -hmm. like starting in media res and then flashing back to earlier. A good example of this is uh Sam Regal running that that was it Sam that ran that the bar the bar fight one shot that they did? Oh, I don't think I saw that one. Where oh God. I think it was, I think it was Sam that ran that one. It was a long ass time ago, so I don't really remember. But basically, <laughs> where the I whole saw that one. the whole thing, yeah. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, it was Sam. Um, the whole thing was like a like this bar brawl and like this. I mean, it wasn't like a bar brawl exactly, but it was like a bunch of stuff that happened that like a fight broke out in a bar for reasons that I don't remember. But every once in a while, Sam would just intercut the action with like a police deposition scene, right? Talking about the bar <laughs> fight and everybody was like giving their like, it was very interesting. It was, so I think you can do it, but I don't know that I would include that in a, in a long-term campaign as more than just a couple of sessions or mm -hmm. like, to punctuate sessions or if I was going to do it um, as sort of like the main shtick of something, then it would be like a, a one shot or a short shot. I think that the problem with doing it too often in a TTRPG would that I feel like it would just create confusion, like a lot of confusion mm -hmm. Yeah, where you wouldn't really know what was happening. I know if, if we, if, if I was in a game where that happened all the time, I would be constantly so confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, very true. Um, so here's the thing. We are already 10 minutes over our stopping point. Oh, we are. I, didn't, I had no idea what time it was. Yeah. Um, oh, man. So, yeah, that, oh, this is, this is an interesting question, though. John Numa says, is a reality show that cuts to interviews and is an example of nonlinear storytelling? I would say kind of because the editing is making it into a lineated story that's mm -hmm. tricking you. I watch a lot of reality TV, so it's tricking you into believing a narrative is going one way. 
Um, so hmm. I think it could technically be a non-linear, but they're trying to pass it off as a linear story, hmm. typically. Mm-hmm. You know, like in cooking shows when they're like, there's a minute left and they haven't like plated things. And you're like, oh my God, the stupid idiot. They probably already played it, plated it. You know, like they're probably just showing that clip at that time <laughs> to create tension. Yeah. Wait, Age of Fit, what are you disagreeing about? I, I, I don't know. I Everyone don't... wants to fight you tonight. I know that tonight is apparently. the disagree with Lucas night, apparently. I don't know what you're <laughs> talking about because I don't listen to the things that come out of my mouth. So it like as soon as it came out of my mouth, it was gone. So you'll have to be more specific. Um... Cite your sources. <laughs> <laughs> um, the office asides make things nonlinear. Hmm. Hmm. I suppose they could. I don't know. I, I have. I think that I think with the with the like asides, right? Like I think maybe we are stretching the definition of nonlinear, right? Because mm-hmm. it's not like that. This, like, those things assume that we are at a particular point in time, right? Which is after the event has taken place, right? And the people in the cutaways are talking about the event that you are in the process of watching, which is assumed to be, I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've already, I've lost my own train of thought. So I don't know. We don't really operate like in a linear fashion <laughs> oh, really Adrian, ever. So it is disagreeing that we have run over. <laughs> That's right. Because time uh, on Ramblemancy is nonlinear. So really we, <laughs> This is actually the beginning of the episode, um, so no. Uh, <laughs> it's all a cycle. Time is fake, yeah. As it began, so too shall it end. Um, As above, so below. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think we're going to start trying to end the episode. There will be an attempt. There will be. T- Let's see how long it takes. <laughs> Nico says this is really like the end of next week's episode. <laughs> non-linear. I love it. That's a big plot that's, twist. Um, that's light. That's you light. can just edit me into the next episode. You, you can just someone can just impersonate me. Yeah. Well, oh man, I'm so lost now. <laughs> what is this editing you speak of? What is that? Ah <laughs> uh, yes. And now Ramblemancy has become a Mobius strip. Oh, yes. Well, it's it's Jeremy uh, Baramy. <laughs> time moves in kind of a Jeremy Baramy. Ah, uh, timey wimey. I could not stop thinking about that when Drac was on when he was guesting and he mm-hmm. did that whole like time Same. is pie YouTube. bit. Yep. Oh, I was so good. Jeremy Baramy. Yeah, that is absolutely what I was thinking of. It's particularly the part where where Chidi is like is like what about what's what about the the dot above the eye? What is this? I'm like, hmm, that's. Tuesdays, or sometimes it's never. Also July. He's like, <laughs> I'm done. This this broke me. <laughs> it broke me. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, that cracks me. It up was every amazing. Time. Every single time that makes me laugh. Um, yeah. Uh, the Good Place is such a good example of um of like hopeful, but hopeful storytelling that's also does show off dark aspects of like human mm-hmm. nature. Like it does both, and I really yeah. admire it. We could have an entire episode on the good place, and I oh, think blame. we should. But uh, we forking should. We forking <laughs> should. <laughs> um, also, I saw somebody earlier. I don't remember who it was. Uh, suggest Olivia that you and I do a podcast where we watch episodes of <laughs> yeah, Lost did, and then I talk about. That. It. Oh yeah, and I will not. I will be moderating only. I'll be. <laughs> I am. I would love that yeah. because I think that Lost is very a very misunderstood show. Um, hey, we're not going to start this now. So <laughs> I would do that. Okay, but if yeah, we that do would that. Be- we also have to do the same thing with Arrow, Olivia. I mean, I would do that. I, I honestly, <laughs> Arrow's like a guilty pleasure show yeah, for it, me, me, honestly. Too, frankly. I, <laughs> yeah, I love the Arrow. Um, it was geek But I would, okay. I would rip it to shreds, though. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it would like, be so mean. I'd be at my meanest watching that show. <laughs> cool. I mean, that's how I'd be during Lost. So, you know what? Like, <laughs> Stephen Amell's stupid face makes me... 
just go <laughs> insane. I just lose it. I just turn so mean. Oh god, that's perfect. Uh, <laughs> oh, we, we're gonna have to do a watch. We're gonna have to do a watch party. You know where we do this. We watch. We watch our our the arrow. We watch whatever, and we do this. We we tear it apart. I don't I'd think you could it. do it on a stream. I think it'd have to be a podcast because I no. think right would be an oh. issue. <laughs> No, no, I just mean like you just casually off stream off camera. Oh yeah, just, yeah, yeah, just yeah. But. Oh my god. Okay. Um. <laughs> okay. Are we? I think we're winding. I think we're yeah, we no, we're nowhere near it. <laughs> it's miles away. Uh, oh Geekouts man. Says Geekouts is uh, now going and his stupid hair also. Olivia, his hair on that show enrages me. <laughs> Wait, which I, he room? just can't act. Like he's just a bad actor, and I think he's like just. Oh, boy. Uh, the whole it's a whole side tangent anyway you'll Which catch in the, Stephen oh, Amell hold on you want to talk about bad acting in Arrow but then in the same breath talk about how Lost is so great and misunderstood come on, come on. I don't know I watched Lost when I was a child so I was convinced by the <laughs> performance very easily mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. <laughs> um all right well um <laughs> unnecessary... that's a preview of our lost yeah. podcast unnecessary so. and pointless love triangles aside um oh, yeah that shit was stupid <laughs> we're gonna this could go... almost be like this could be like patreon material I know. <laughs> it really could be speaking um, of which we have a patreon you should check it out if you've just now entered here and you've seen that we have a uh, seen us and you like what you see right. and our faces check out our patreon we just put up a thing we call tabletop tool chest yesterday it's a little story kernels that we make up that is uh, bi-weekly that means every other week and yeah yesterday's was modern fantasy npcs that went up so look out for that it's up it's really cool um it's also uh world builders and end of media end of month media sorry that's also up there and uh, other ways to support the channel is get the merch. We got these. We got these stickers. I like to have the merch nearby because I can can actually just be goofy with it and just show it off. We have this mug. Some of y'all have this mug. Um, we also have a sweater that's new. We have a new sweater out with our Infinite Horizon art this characters. Sorry, season two Ooh. art characters. Yep. Woo. Yeah. I don't know what else to say except join the Discord because on the Discord you can keep keep track with all of our shenanigans on the channels you if you subscribe and you're on the discord you can get a backlog of all of our lower tier material all of our end of month media as i mentioned earlier and uh you can share your dreams your schemes and your D. well i said that all wrong <laughs> i need a script <laughs> you didn't get the script we sent over for this episode uh no no i didn't um i'll you know I did. I lied. I'm sorry. <laughs> Rose says, come to Discord. We have nonsense. <laughs> come to Discord. It's lovely. Which, which is correct. Yeah. It's correct. And I love it so uh, much. And Bully Lucas. <laughs> yeah. Oh, another fun thing about the Discord is uh, today I updated my uh, fan cast for Infinite Horizon. So, so those are in there. Did. Those are in there with like some, so newer, some newer stuff. Um, and I reminded people of the old one as well so yeah that's what i got that's all i got um we will return on tuesday i forgot what fucking day it was uh we will return on tuesday with into <laughs> deep our water deep dragon heist actual play um deep deep deep, deep. it's very very good um and yeah and of course infinite horizon on wednesday as always Sorry, I'm looking. I'm sorry. I am checking wild. to see who's who's live that we can raid. Um, and of course, on Friday, a week from today, we will be back with Ramble Mancy, where we will have Omar Najam talking about uh, media favorites. Yeah, so, I can't wait for that. Oh, That's gosh, good. I'm so excited. Um, Me too. Omar is somebody good. who is known for his uh, his media references. So i know that he's ready to talk our ear off about yeah. uh Ooh, about all the stuff and that's why i always love having guests is because i always learn something if it's a topic we've talked about in the past or not i'm st- if, but especially here if it's one that we've talked about in the past and we bring in a guest we get i get a whole different perspective a whole different like idea and i love that so much yeah absolutely it's so i'm like fun. oh i didn't even see that before you know <laughs> yeah uh, let's see. If, 
it's going to make me log in so, to raid. So I'm going to do that real quick. Um, our stream is going to be even longer than we... Ha, ha, ha. This is great. This is... <laughs> We should. We could probably. I remember when. Remember when Ramble Mancies were only an hour long. Oh my god! Y'all, can you remember that? I. How did you guys shut? Not to. I say this well, lovingly. How did you guys shut up? We well, we didn't. We we had a meeting. We, we said we have to go longer. <laughs> we have to make our. We have to make our episodes longer. Yeah. Yeah. We we made the decision shortly after. Not shortly after, but sometime we're like, mm, no, because you see, we started warming up right at the end. We're like, now we're getting into it, so we had to like, yeah. Maybe I just want everyone to know while we were talking a second ago, my tarot cards just fell out of my bag and were just spilling all over the floor. I did not move. I don't know. It was a little scary. It's, a little, it's important to know what order they fell on the floor right now. I don't know. I picked them up, so I ruined it. <laughs> all right. Okay. I think <laughs> we are going to go raid Vanna because she is oh, awesome. uh, live playing Dead by Daylight, thanks, which is- Thanks so much for Ooh. having me on Ramble Mancy. Always fun. Yeah, it's Talk always to good boys. to have you, Olivia. Yep. Um, we will Ooh. see you, um, we'll see you on Tuesday for In Too Deep, but if not, we will see you the next time you decide to come roll with us. Mm. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night. Good night and good, good zone. zone.